Hi, and welcome back to the R3, R3S of the RC3 in Monheim. We, you can reach us on HackInt IRC in the channel RC3-R3S, on Twitter and Mastodon with the hashtag RC3R3S, and additionally on Mastodon with our handle at R3S at chaos.social. <laughs> so, after two more legal talks, now something more technical. And when I asked the speaker, who is again on the stage with us, thanks for joining us. When I asked him, how shall I introduce you, he said, Google me. And so I did. So what did I find? I found a veteran U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel from the Vietnam War. I think that's not him. I found a graduate of the Rockledge High School in Rockledge, Florida. I think that's neither him. <clears throat> then I found some guy from Essen. So here, live and, live and in person, Daniel Maslowski with his talk, Introducing UTK Web, a web developer's view on firmware. Have fun. Hi, uh, and thanks for the quick introduction. Um, yeah, you might know me from uh, previous talks. Uh, usually I just uh, take things apart and talk about it, or I speak about some general things regarding software engineering, uh, which is also my main field of work. Um, anyway, this time I built a tool uh, which I'm going to introduce. Um, here's the little agenda. I will first give a very brief introduction also on me because not everybody necessarily knows me. I will talk a bit about motivation, why I'm doing what I'm doing here, what you can use it for and so on. And then I will explain actually what the tool is, uh, show what it implements and finally give you some sort of outlook uh, what's coming in the future. So on me, I'm Daniel. Um, I actually have a uh, few backgrounds uh, first in IT security. I've been studying that for years uh, and then I switched over to computer science. But for a living, I decided to actually do something more practical uh, and that made me become a software engineer eventually. I mostly work on the web, so I'm building web applications, uh, which is also what this tool uh, here is about. Uh, but I also have some interest in infrastructure and, you know, to run your applications and so on. You need to have infrastructure underneath you. And that's how I eventually uh, looked at more and more things out there. And a friend of mine introduced me to firmware, which this tool integrates in. And so this is uh, what I'm also doing in the open source space. I'm developing several tools which are about firmware. I also work on firmware directly sometimes. And well, eventually I need to do some reverse engineering, uh, which is uh, the sad truth of uh, the current state of how hardware works in the industry. <laughs> um, now about application development in general. As an application developer, I need to have some awareness of a few things. First of all, I need to have an understanding of the domain where I'm developing. And by domain, I'm talking about you know, what the application is actually about. So let's, let's just take a very, very stupid example. Uh, the Corona Van app that was made in Germany uh, the, the domain of that application, well, it's about tracing, it's about Corona. And so you, in order to you know, talk about it, to develop it, you need to understand what it's actually about. And the second thing that you need to know is the environment an application lives in. And that's on the one hand side platforms. Uh, coming back to the example, uh, that would be mobile platforms in this case. It could also be wearables or something like that. 
um, and we have to know APIs. So you know that, especially for the Corona Warn app, uh, there actually had to be new APIs implemented by both Google and Apple so that uh, you know, the application could get its functionality. And eventually, uh, it's very, very handy to know some frameworks so that you, know, you have something to build on top of so you don't need to like, reinvent, uh, reinvent the wheel all the time. Now, the, the uh, second part, and that's the visual part, is actually the UX design. And in large companies, um, there are often dedicated people doing that, or even dedicated teams doing that. So over the course of my career, I've been working with several people doing this sort of work. And eventually, I you know, also ha I had to get an understanding of that, because UX and UI, you know, those are fancy, fancy buzzwords. Uh, but what it actually means is that I need to also get an understanding of aesthetics on the other, uh, on the one hand side. I need to know, uh, you know, what seems appealing to people, and that's all about shapes and colors, about spacings, topography, icons. Um, but on the other hand, there are also some functional requirements that you have uh, regarding UX. And that's where we came up with the idea of so-called widgets. Uh, widgets are basically you know, everything that you can see in, a, in an application that you can interact with. And many of them are actually reappearing all the time. For example, everyone knows buttons, right? So you know you can click a button. If you start uh, diving further into it, at some point you will get an understanding that, well, a button is actually not just a button, right? So you can have buttons in, and that's the aesthetics again, in different shapes and so on, colors and so on. Um, but on the other hand, you can also have different functionalities. And that's what you know, many people don't even think about, actually. Uh, coming back to the button example, there are buttons which are stateless, so you can just click them once, and then something happens. Um, but there are also the stateful buttons, so you can click those buttons, and they will reflect something. So those are buttons which you might know from old cassette tape recorders. So you press a button and then it stays in place. And that's what, what we now also call radio buttons still, even on computers where we don't have those physical buttons. And I was thinking about this a lot. And uh, th there is this one thing uh, which was always puzzling me. So people with new computers, at some point, you know, when, when I was working together with people, I was using their machine uh, and I tried to scroll. And for some reason, it didn't work. Uh, and they showed me, no, no, you need to move your hand the other way. And I said, okay, why, why is that the case? And they call it natural scrolling. And they told me that the image behind it is actually that you're moving paper around. I was thinking about it, um, and that, you know, gave me the idea what the word actually stems from. So if I imagine a very ancient scroll, right, something that you can hold in your hand, imagine you're holding it like this, you can also move it up and down if you just wound it up on something, like a stick, for example. So that's like the very, very ancient sort of user interface where scrolling comes from. And I thought about, well, on the machine, I have something like scroll bars. Did we also have that in the past? And why did we actually come up with this non-natural way of scrolling, which I, I was actually used to? Um, and so I thought, OK, that's like when I attach a string on that stick uh, where, the scroll, uh, where the scroll is hanging. And then I could also move it that way. Um, but there's nothing, nothing natural actually about it. Even the scroll itself is not a natural thing, right? It's something that somebody made. It's a creative thing. And it's also some sort of engineering. And now, depending on how you wind up that string, that actually determines your scroll direction, right? So you can wind it forward or backwards. And then depending on that direction, when you pull, it either goes up or down. Anyway, that was a bit of an aside. Um, so what I want to say in summary is that you know, I'm, I'm dealing a lot with these ideas. And I want to bring them into play. 
And this brings us to firmware. So there is one sort of industry standard now, which is called UEFI, which has become very much ubiquitous. You will find it everywhere. You find it in laptops, you find it on desktop machines, on server platforms even. Um, and they also started to roll it out to other places. Like uh, usually we know it from the Intel and AMD platforms, but it's also now on ARM, uh, even RISC-V decided to go that path. And that means that we need to have good tooling to understand it. And this is what my tool is actually about. I wanted to have a good understanding. Um, now, looking at this example here, uh, this is where UEFI is actually not too much of a standard. Um, it doesn't even live on its own, but it's part of an entire platform. And if you look at this very example here, this is from an Intel platform. Um, they just partition their firmware images into multiple regions. So when, when you get a file for, let's say, a firmware upgrade, or you just um, read it out from your laptop, uh, you can look at the file in that way, and you can divide it into those sections. Not everyone is doing it exactly like that. For example, AMD is doing it somewhat different in some regards. Um, but anyway, let's look a bit uh, closer at the UEFI part here. It's, it's quite a complex standard on itself. And let's look at the boot flow. So when you boot up a machine that is running UEFI, it actually runs through a bunch of so-called phases. Um, in other firmware uh, implementations, you might also know this at uh, uh, just uh, know it as some different terms. Uh, they might be called stages, but eventually the idea is always the same. There is something that is starting, and then some sort of program flow is happening. At some point, you have a, a decision to make. In UEFI, that's called BDS, or Boot Device Select. That's where your actual operating system is starting, and where you need to decide where to start from. Again, we can have a user interface here, um, which is not exactly what my tool is about, but what I was also thinking about simulating. Um, but anyway, so this is, uh, this is where the firmware ends and your operating starts. Uh, I borrowed this slide from the UEFI forum. Uh, there was a, a talk recently on new ideas in, in firmware. So if you, if you remember the flow that uh, you might have seen in UEFI before, they have these phases, SEC, Dixie, and BDS. Um, there is actually a bit more to it, uh, but anyway, so th this uh, is just to have a rough outline of what we're talking about and the complexity that you face here. And now let's have some more motivation. So what are we actually looking at here and why do we do so? On the one hand side, and this is also especially interesting for us here at the Chaos Communication Congress, or this time the remote, Congress, uh, we're talking a lot about security. And let's be honest, everybody knows that security through obscurity is not working out eventually. So at every Congress, we're seeing dozens of examples where it doesn't work. Um, so what we need instead is we need better tools to look at what we already have. And this is hopefully something I can uh, provide here. So in the UEFI space, there have already been so-called implants. So think of malware, but not malware that is running in your operating system, but malware that is actually baked into your firmware at some point. So it's entirely possible that somebody installed something on your machine. Now you come along, you toss out your hard drive or SSD, throw it away, you just take a fresh new one, but you still have the malware because it's part of your main board. So that's in a small storage that is actually on your machine. So, I mean, it's not too practical to throw away your machines all the time, right? Unless they are as cheap as possible, but even then, maybe it's not so friendly for the environment. That's the one hand side. Um, the other hand is most of what we're seeing in the firmware space is very much proprietary and closed source today. And so we're trying to build more open tools 
uh, not just uh, people in the open source community, by the way, um, but also more and more companies are interesting, uh, interested in that. And they actually started talking to the community. We have very, very huge projects actually looking into that. For example, the OCP, the Open Compute Project, which is all about large servers and data centers and so on. And what they actually need is they need to have very, very high availability and they need to have a very good understanding of what's going on in their machines. Okay, so this is what I want to provide. And now on the other hand, of course, there are already other tools, right? So there are proprietary tools from vendors. Uh, AMI, for example, a very well-known vendor for firmware. They have their tool called MM Tool for manipulating firmware images. Intel has theirs. And then we have lots of open source tools. Now I was looking at those tools. Um, some are very nice already. Some have a very, very nice user interface. And eventually, um, well, most of them are just looking at firmware images in terms of trees and tables. They're very basic data structures. And well, <laughs> if you just draw them down there, you don't really get an exact understanding of what you have. So you would need to read all those specifications around what you're looking at. Uh, for UFI, for example, you would need to read, I don't know how many thousands of pages, but it, I can promise you it's more than 5,000. Um, I haven't seen them all, I've looked at some of them. And so I wanted to come up with a better idea or maybe just a different idea. I'm not saying that this year is bad, it's just not suitable for me just to get an understanding. And this is what UTK Web is about. And it actually started when I was talking to Ryan. Uh, Ryan is uh, one of the developers of the tools that are being used at Google's data centers, for example. Um, there is a project called Linux Boot. It's quite large now, and what it requires is lots of tooling. And one of those very tools is UTK itself, hence the name, it's the UEFI toolkit. And the other tool, or one of the other tools is called FMAP. And what FMAP does is it's actually very, very simple. It's looking at a file and it will tell you about how many parts of that file are actually used data. And well, if you just um, output that in, a, let's say, in a terminal, uh, it's, it's very nice, so you can represent different blocks as, let's say, hashes, for example, or dots, or zeros to indicate that some block is really just uh, empty, so that's what the Fs are. Um, so if you look at the, the hex values, you will just see F, 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 F. Uh, the zeros just mean it's all zeros, and the actual useful data is where it's something else, so not all zero and not all just F. And I thought, okay, I can do this myself um, in a different way. As a web developer, I can just, uh, you know, I can just show boxes, <laughs> which are sort of the same, um, but it's not just boxes, it's also colors, right? So colors are very, very good indicators for us. They are very, very easy and helpful. So don't even need to closely read like, okay, is it a hash now? Is it a dot or something? So not in mono color, but in various colors. And then Ryan asked me again, uh, could you pick some colors which also work out for people with color blindness? And I, first of all, I had to do a lot of research um, because unfortunately I'm not color blind myself, at least to my knowledge. So, you know, I, I didn't really have a good understanding of that. Which brings us back to the domain topic. So here I'm touching another domain again. Um, so fortunately I was very lucky and other people had already done lots of research in that space. And so I could find a very nice color palette, uh, which I'm using here now. So I can't tell it myself, but I hope that some colorblind person can at some point tell me if they can actually distinguish those colors here. Because otherwise this is entirely pointless because I'm just using colors. So this is now the current state of development in UTK. 
what I have so far is representations of what is in generally uh, called a directory. Or if you think about file systems, it's sometimes also called a folder, or it might be called something else. Um, the rough idea is it's just a collection of files. And each of those files in a directory is represented as a just simple entry, right? So entry is a very, very generic term. Um, I could also have named that file, but yeah, it doesn't really matter too much here. Anyway, those are very, very simple components I could model. And what I could think about that is, you know, always the same for those is a directory is always this sort of collection and an entry is always something more specific. And I wanted to have a tool that is a, a bit more generic even and that goes beyond just files and directories, but also the specifics of those files. Because we need to have, you know, for UFI a clear understanding of the specifics of those files. Meta information, for example. On the other hand, I've already shown you this. I have this flash usage view here. Uh, the component behind that is called fmap. And because those images here, those file images, can grow very, very large. I made a quick navigation bar. That's what you see here in the screenshot on the very top. It allows you to jump to a very specific directory, or as it's called in UEFI, an FV, a former volume. Now, I, I just told you that I wanted to be a bit more generic. And I started looking a lot into the AMD platforms. They have something that is called PSP, or was called PSP. I don't know why, but they renamed it. Now it's called ASP, AMD's Secure Processor, something like that. Previously, it was Platform Security Processor. You know, those names can always change a bit. It's a bit about marketing as well. Um, anyway, so there is a tool out there uh, which already allowed reading the data structures for PSP. And I wanted to have some format that I could use on my site. So what I did was uh, I went to the maintainers of PSP tool and I added JSON output support. Because JSON is a format that I can easily use natively in web development. It's the JavaScript object notation. So I can just use it in JavaScript right away. And then I could model my components here. And here you can see uh, the so-called entries for PSP. And you can also see that you know, they contain uh, lots of data, actually. And you know, they can have various dimensions. I'm using emoji as some sort of indicators. Uh, sometimes I'm just printing out values. And those are the specifics of those entries. And I already told you that there is lots of tools out there. So I started to integrate more and more. I also filed a pull request to UFI firmware parser. So that can also give us JSON output now. Um, at some point, you know, <laughs> I started to have various ways to look at former images. So I added a small tab bar where you can just switch between the different views. And well, eventually what it also means to do all this work is I need to transform the data I can get out from the existing tools. And what you see here is something that is very, very typical for working with data structures and representing them. You need to transform the data in a way such that it's suitable for your UI components or widgets. In, in this example here, this is taken from UTK. We have something that is called value. We have something that is called files. And I'm transforming them in such a way that I can use them in my tool. I promised in the uh, abstract that I wanted to also show you something that I actually found on firmware and which might be interesting to you now. Um, it's marked here. Actually, the tool allows you to mark things already. Uh, this is called ASRock Net SMTP. SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, tells us, well, there is an email client in your firmware. And I cannot tell you why it's there. I haven't actually asked the vendor. Um, I, I might do that at some point, I'm not sure yet. Um, but anyway, this is why I actually want to look at my firmware uh, 
just myself. So I want to see what's going on there. And maybe I want to replace it with something or, you know, just remove things. And this is what UTK, the tool itself, allows us to do, similar to uh, many other tools. But yeah, UTK is what I'm using and what I got to know. So here is a very, very brief outlook. What I want to do is I want to integrate UTK itself into UTK web. And that would mean that I need to have an in-browser backend. I can do that with today's technologies. There is something called WASM or WebAssembly. And then I will just go ahead and integrate other tools like Mimoya's firmware toolkit, uh, which uh, you might have seen at other uh, talks before. So Mimoya introduced that at some point um, at last year's Congress, I think. Then there is many, many other tools I will try to integrate. Maybe I will just need to add some more JSON support or something like that. And eventually, I'm open for some questions if you have any. And on the very last slide here, uh, you already have the references so you can quickly look things up. Uh, the PDF version of the slides is already online if you're looking live. Um, if you want to see the uh, source code to the slides, I will also upload those in a bit. With that, thank you very much. So yeah, thank you for uh, for your time. Thank you for preparing a talk. Um, so your talk seems to have been very comprehensive as we currently don't have any questions uh, forwarded by the Signal Angels. I had a quick look into the IRC and there were no questions either, either so I believe you were quite comprehensive in your talk. <laughs> thank you, I hope so. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank well. you for coming over here. And yeah, have a nice RC3 